Good morning and welcome to the Sabi Sands. It's a beautiful morning here. There's a bit of cloud cover for now, but I think a lot of that will burn off a little bit later. And myself and Brent are, have been out for about 15 minutes now exploring. Haven't come up with anything yet. But we have just come across a hornbill. I'm not sure if Brian's going to be able to get an angle from it. We've been following it around for a few minutes now. But it keeps flying away from us. As Brian zooms in, you'll notice it's got a very large grasshopper that it's busy trying to feed on. Oh, and there you can see it's just making sure it's dead. It looks like trying to bang it against one of those branches. It really is a monster grasshopper. Slightly obscured, but we can't do anything about that, sadly. I fear if we move, it'll fly off. But I'm sure you've got a good idea of what's going on. While we watch him, welcome again, especially to any newcomers who may be joining for the first time. And for those newcomers, just to let you know, it is an interactive live safari. So... You can ask us questions at any given stage, and to do that, you would hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send an email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Well, not the clearest view, but he's finally managed to swallow that massive grasshopper. Something I don't envy a lot of the animals, they consume very large portions of food that really make them look quite uncomfortable when they're swallowing them but that's the way it is and now it's time to make sure that beak is maintained in good order such pretty birds the yellow-billed hornbill one of my favorites out here But not the best view of these ones, so we'll continue. Aha, uh -huh, they've just moved to a far better spot. And interestingly, it looks like it could be gonna double check I thought one might be a youngster the one on the right but in fact they are both adults and in all likelihood a pair I'm not sure exactly what the one on the right has in its bill it looks like a small berry of sorts It appears as if she might be trying to offer it as a gift. Look at that. A gift offering. So, possibly from the male to the female. The only reason I say that is because the one that handed over the gift was slightly smaller than the one that received it. And in the bird world, it's often that the males are slightly smaller than the females. And not uncommon for birds to bring gifts to their mates to enforce bonds. A lot of the birds out here are monogamous and you can therefore understand how a 
a gesture like that can pay off in the long run, consider they spend their lives together. Oh, wonderful. So, just to keep you updated on the plans for this morning, Brent is going to work in the more southern parts of the property where I'm going to move over into the northern parts. And that's simply just to mix it up for the two of us. He, through default more than anything, has ended up spending quite a lot of time in the north over the last few days and myself in the south. So we're kind of just switching it up a little bit so that we get to see a little bit of different scenery. But we don't have too much to go on in terms of any tracks or signs at the moment. It's a bit of a fresh start this evening, or this morning. As it often base or focus our drive on in terms of where we are heading, looking for them, move great distances at night. Therefore, it's only when you drive around in the morning that you find any updates as to where they may be or where they may have moved. And so far, nothing. Buffalo tracks heading down this road in the same direction as us. So there's a chance we could bump into them shortly. On camera this morning on my vehicle it's Brian. So I'm teamed up with Brian again and Brent and Andrew are teamed up together with Alex in final control. Now, it looks like it's a little bit of a way off, but there is what I think is a Batalia Eagle perched in, oh no, sneaky thing. <laughs> well, there was a Batalia Eagle perched in a Marilla tree that Brian's just going to focus on now. So right there on that dead branch was a Battalier Eagle. I'm surprised it flew off. We're quite far away from it, but maybe it decided that it was simply time to start its day. Not likely though. A lot of the birds of prey will typically get active only once the sun has heated up the earth a little bit and then hot thermals begin to rise up off the earth. And it's those thermals that a lot of the birds of prey will ride along and use those thermals to float effortlessly and efficiently above this area in order to search for prey. Well, not only prey, a bird like the Batalier is one that will do a lot of scavenging as well. They can hunt for themselves, certainly, but they are also renowned to scavenge where they can. If you see bateleurs together with tawny eagles or hooded vultures, there's also a strong chance there could be a kill nearby. So, also a very good indicator bird for us if there's any potential carcasses around.
Georgie in Australia. Good morning and welcome on board. Georgie says she knows of the yellow-billed hornbill and the red-billed hornbill, which are two quite common hornbills of this area, as well as the ground hornbill. And she's asking whether there's any bigger species than the ground hornbill. And as far as I'm aware, there are not. I'm just going to check over here. What was it that I saw here? I was hoping it was an elephant, but I'm just going to double check. So, Georgie, back to your question. Um, no, there's no larger species than the ground hornbill. It is the largest of the hornbill species, but you do get some very large hornbills that are part of the trumpeter hornbill family. So, those are in thicker vegetation usually, or better forested areas. So, you don't really get them here too often, but we may see them occasionally in the Sabi sands, but typically along the sand river where there, or the Sabi river, where there are very big trees. At Brent, confirm you at Bufflesick Dam. Okay, copy. Um, well then I'll head to the south then, because that's where I was headed. Interesting. So Brent's uh, changed the plan a little bit, which is not a problem. So we'll just continue down this way. Another hornbill that you get in this area, Georgie, is the southern grey hornbill. So that's another one to look out for while we're here that we could show you. Possibly the crowned hornbill, possibly the trumpeter hornbill but none are as big as the ground hornbill. Oh, what a bug. Beautiful female water bug. I'm wondering if there's going to be any more floating about because it's not really common for them to be on their own, especially the females. And it's an antelope that we don't see very often here relative to the others. As it begins to turn, you'll notice there's a bright white patch on its rump and if it was to be facing completely away from us which it may at any stage it makes a perfect white circle oh there we go you'll also notice that its coat is quite shaggy and has long fur relative to most of the antelope out here Oh, there was another one nearby. It was just obscured by a marula tree that had been pushed over.
Brian, there's a bird of prey that's just landed in the dead tree at kind of 10 o'clock from us. It is quite far away, but might be worth trying to get to. Well, it's a little bit obscured and quite far away, but we can try and get a little bit closer. It's a goshawk. Checking. It's the dark chancing goshawk. You get a dark chancing and a pale chancing goshawk that look very, very similar. They just occur in different areas, and I just got confused as to which one we get here. But this is the dark chancing goshawk, and I'm going to try and get a little bit closer to it because it is such a pretty bird. Especially with this early morning sunlight. That's as good as we're going to get for now. Still a little bit far off to appreciate its beauty and it is one of the tricky things out here there's so many beautiful animals but unless you've got a close-up visual of them it's hard to appreciate that beauty So we'll continue and hope to get the dark chancing goshawk. Well, let's see if we can find a little gap here. There's another bird that I've just seen further down. So if we get onto a firebreaker, it'll lead us directly to not only this one, but also to another pretty bird. firebreak road that runs just ahead of us here. Claire in New York, good morning and welcome on board. Seeing as though we're on the subject of birds, Claire has asked whether I've seen a honey guide bird doing its dance before. Now, I haven't seen a dance, but I have been in a situation where honey guides flown up to us, it was a group of us on a walking safari and really did get our attention. I wouldn't call it a dance, so to speak, but it, it came up and, and called insistently. And what honey guides will do is they'll actually guide sometimes animals and, well, sometimes human animals to beehives. Now, in order the reason why they do that is to hopefully show an animal like a honey badger where the beehive is. The honey badger will then break into the beehive and the honey guide will then be able to feed on little bits of honey that the honey badger doesn't consume. So essentially are aiding a break-in and then they get to steal some of the spoils and they do do that with humans as well so a honey guide did lead us it was about 15 minutes of walking to a beehive we didn't crack the beehive open for the honey guide sadly but it was really unbelievable to be led to a beehive by a honey guide a completely wild bird 
had somehow put two and two together and realized that there's a chance that us humans could break into their, their hive. Oh, Brian, are you going to be able to get these guys on the right here? To pull this branch down for you. Well done, Brian. Those are white crested helmet trikes. Incredibly pretty birds, and we saw some yesterday. I'm gonna have to let. Uh, there you go. And they're gonna mob this bell, uh, dark chance in Gosok now. Well, wasn't that cool to see? And I should have actually put two and two together as, so, as soon as I saw them land in the tree next to us. I should have told you that there's a strong chance that they will go and mob that dark chance in Gosok. They're small, but they back themselves and are quite aggressive, and so are their cousins, the Retz's helmet trike. And for those of you who were on board with us yesterday, we did see an adult white crested helmet trike along with a juvenile. The other bird, which I thought was a warbird, is still sitting, sunning itself on a dead tree. It is, and it's ahead of us. So let's hope it stays there because the sunlight at the moment is very beautiful. signals improved so you would have just heard myself and Brian debating whether to stop and show you this beautiful sight because we were concerned that the signal might be up to scratch but Alex said it has recovered and the previous bird that we were hoping and showing you flew off but these magpie shrikes don't look like they're going anywhere for now and they're really enjoying basking in the sun They live in family flocks, so in all likelihood you will see families flying together. So this could well be the adults with their offspring from this year. Very vocal this morning. Here comes another one. Boop! Another youngster. And you can see even the, the youngsters have got, I think it's possibly even four youngsters in amongst there. Their tails are a little bit shorter than the adults. Or maybe it's the two adults on the right at the back and on the right, and three youngsters 
lined up on the left. I was saying a little bit earlier before we lost signal that Brent's having a little bit of difficulties with his vehicle. That's why we haven't cut across to him to say good morning yet and find out what he's up to. But he is searching around for animals and made his way to Buffalzook Dam initially. But hasn't come up with anything yet and hopefully he'll be able to fix up his vehicle, whatever the problem could be there. If he doesn't, at least he's still out there, <coughs> excuse me, searching for animals, and he can, <coughs> wee, excuse me, let us know whether he finds anything, so at least there are some extra eyes, eyes and ears out here, even if he can't broadcast, it certainly does help to have him out. Amy on Twitter, good morning and welcome on board. Again, on the subject of birds, Amy is interested to know what kinds of owls we get here, Jim. And we get a host of different types of owls, ranging from a very small owl, or a few very small ones, called the pearl spotted owlet or the barred owlet, which are the size of a dove, a very small bird, ranging up to the giant eagle owl, or as it's more recently known the Verose Eagle Owl so a host ranging from very small coming weeks we'll be able to find some for you <coughs> I was searching for the Verose Eagle Owl which is the largest owl we get in this area because Mark, one of the other presenters, had given me an update that he had heard some calling near Twin Dams, so we drove around searching the big trees around Twin Dams yesterday, but didn't come up with anything. Well, the good news is, is that Brent and Andrew have managed to establish whatever the problem was and have now got a broadcast. So that's great news and we'll cut across to them so that they can say good morning and find out what they've been up to. And myself and Brian will continue on the search for anything interesting. Good morning everyone, welcome on Game Drive. I'm with Andrew this morning um, and we are checking the north and eastern parts of the reserve for any tracks and any animals. We've had no luck yet, um, but to answer a question from yesterday, RC from the Netherlands was asking about this plant, um, which we call Dwarf Wild Sage. It actually has a bunch of other names, but I went to my indigenous healing plant bible um, and found what it was. Just remember what page it was on. Uh, 256, if I remember correctly. There we go.
<laughs> so, um, this is quite an old book, but it's called Creeping Sage or Small Sage, and it's a Salvia Repens. Um, let me, sorry, I can't see where I'm looking. There we go. A Creeping Sage or Small Sage. Um, in the, some of the newer books, it's called a Dwarf Sage. But there we go. Salvia repens. I see. I hope that answers the question for you. Okay. We're going to continue on. See what tracks and whatnot we can find. Hat on. I think it's going to be a, a stinker of a day. It's already quite warm. That little cold snap we had didn't seem to last too long. Yours, yours coming. Uh, good morning. Sorry, our comms are still giving us a bit of problems. Uh, Scott said you might have something on the Buffalo Hook cut line. Yeah, I've got a line. Uh, copy whereabouts on Buffalo Hook cut line? Right, they come from Garago Shortcut. Just right here. Okay, copy. Um, how many stations are with you there? Just myself, Brent. Copy, I'd like to be the second station joining you there. Big wheel now. I'm um, at Buffalo's Hook West uh, Junction with, um, sorry, yeah, Buffalo's Hook Dam West Junction with Buffalo's Hook. Okay, then you just drive west. Hi, Fern, thank you very much, Ross. Okay, that's quite nice. Um, something I haven't seen yet since I've been at Juma. Um, there's a, a big breeding herd of buffalo. So um, they're on the cut line, so we're going to head west um, and see if we can see them. Sometimes it's a bit more interesting than the old uh, buffalo boys in those little groups. We've got babies and there's quite a lot more activity around a big breeding herd than the old boys. So they are right on our boundary, so I am going to go a little bit faster than I normally would, just to ensure we don't lose them and they cross out. Bouncy, bouncy. Wonderful morning light we have. We keep getting these high clouds in the morning that almost look like a sort of edge of a cold front coming in from the Mozambique coast, but um, they seem to burn off quite quickly. Um, and I haven't really checked any satellite images for the last few days. So hopefully the cold front stays away. Um, and for those of you who are wondering where Mark is, Mark is on leave, taking a well-earned rest, um, and he'll be back next week. So big it. Go ahead, yours. Yeah, I 
message this morning from the Ambiban Globe as well, I'm on my way here, and I was coming from the east, so just uh, on your way here, maybe you will bump into them as well. Copy, thanks very much. So there's also apparently some elephant in the area uh, between us and, uh, and the buffalo, so we might bump into them um, on our way to the buffalo. If you have any questions, um, please on Twitter, just hashtag Safari Live um, and via email questions at wildearth.tv. Similar smell to cows and um, buffalo dung. To give you guys an idea at home what we're smelling, it's just sort of a, like a really mass of cows that, that smell, very strong excrement smell. It looks like they've walked down this road. Um, from listening to the radio, unfortunately, it seems like the lions have gone the opposite direction. Um, to what the buffalo went, which is a little disappointing.
So I can see the other bear. There's could be up to about 100 animals in this herd. Um, we're right on the edge of it, so I'm not going to guess till I can see the rest of them. Gestations with uh, Kambi and Yari. Just saying two stations with uh, Kambi and Yari. Okay, There we go. So it's um, probably uh, between, I'd say, 60, 70, and 100 animals here. Um, we're right on the edge of the herd and they continue westwards over the little rise. Um, and behind that termite mound. You can just see a few horns sticking out through the grass. So if we come and have a look at these guys closest to us, I mean, you can notice immediately the difference between a buffalo cow and a buffalo bull. They don't have those big bosses in between. And you can see there's lots of little youngsters around as well. Uh, buffalo don't have a breeding season as such, they breed throughout the year. Um, and quite interestingly, um, we'll see if we can find one suckling. Um, here we go, oh, it's a nice big cow. See, there's that, none of that sort of very distinct. Start and end your day on safari. It Oh, you can, I don't know if you guys heard that, so with the herds, there's a... Oh, there's a lot of people asking where the lions are in relation to the buffalo. Unfortunately, the buffalo have moved north and the lions... I'm sorry, the buffalo have moved west and the, the lions have moved east. So... Unfortunately, or we never know, there could be other lines that come in from the north or from the, from the west. But at the moment, the lines we saw last night are quite a long way away from here. I don't know if you heard that. So, you hear that very often around the buffalo herd. There's a lot of sort of argy-bargy, so to speak, pushing and shoving and... Um, that goes on in a buffalo herd. Oh, shame. Um, that one, that buffalo you're on, Andrew, if you just go back to its back leg and then zoom in a little bit. Oh, she's moving. She's got a wound there. It, it almost looks like a fungal infection, though. It's actually gone raw and there's lots of flies in it. Uh, all the flies could be keeping it open. So let's have a look. There's quite a lot of calves in here. Yeah, I don't know if you guys can hear that. But really, I think I've got an idea. What we're going to do, there's a big termite mound up ahead. I'm going to see if we can just get a bit of elevation so we can look down on the herd. Very, very important cog in the ecosystem here. In these big herds of buffalo, because so they come through the, the grass, they come through, trample the grass, uh, and what uh, other important thing they do is, as they move, they fertilize by defecating as they go. So that's very important um, for the push. So they're sort of big, mobile. Lawn mowers and fertilizing machines, all in, all rolled into one. There we can see there's a young bull in front of us here. Whoops, there's a big stump that in the grass we didn't see. There we go. Um, just quickly, Andrew, I don't know if you see the calf between the back legs. Now that's a very special adaptation that um, buffalo have because the herds move so often. 
the calves will suckle from between the mother's legs and they can suckle while on the move. So what this does is enables the herd to remain mobile and, and the youngsters to still <laughs> and the youngsters to still be able to feed while the herd is moving. And you can see that if you go slightly to the right and that one is also between his mom's legs and and suckling. So it's quite an interesting um, interesting feeding method. One unfortunate thing being a little buffalo suckling between your mom's back legs is you quite often get pooed on. Mm -hmm. And I've seen it a few times while while suckling the poor poor youngsters have had um, had um, been defecated on. I'm wondering where all the breeding bulls are. They'll be around. At the moment I can only see some young bulls. Um, let's see why Andrew pans. I'll see. Come, keep coming a little bit. There we go. That guy in center of frame now. You can see he's a young bull. You can see his boss is starting to develop. But there's still a lot of hair on it and it's still quite soft. Here's another young bull. So they've probably been resting and they'll look to start moving possibly quite shortly. Um, unless they've been moving from early this morning. But it looks like from the flattened grass that they spent the night in this area. So they would have... Oh, there we go. There's a bit of argy-bargy. So... And these herds will normally drink once a day, sometimes twice a day. And as the seasons become drier, um, the, the herds quite often become a bit bigger and they, they join up with other herds. And that's to avoid predation from lions because, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen, buffalo sometimes care, are very, very defensive over the young, even though if the lions catch a buffalo part of the herd, the bulls will come back and chase the lions off. Um, so in bigger herds, obviously there's more big bulls that make it a bit easier for them to defend against lions. And also with a lot of animals, they're just working on the law of averages. The more of us there are, the less likely I'm the one that's going to get eaten. Let me see. Lots of ox peckers with the herd. Welcome on board. And we've just stumbled across a breeding herd of elephants. So that's great news. We haven't seen elephant for so long. And there's most of them are crossing from left to right over the road. And I can still see one that needs to cross over possibly more so we'll just wait for that one because it's going to provide us the best view sadly we're in a very thick area here and there are a f because it is a breeding herd we don't want to intrude too much on their space because the mothers with their young can be quite defensive Brian is doing the correct thing and he's going to pan across to some other elephants while we wait for the other individual to cross. And there he's found a youngster. And you can see quite a few moving even in the background behind the one that's in shot. The individual on the left now, Brian, is probably going to start working for you very shortly. Well, isn't this great news? And I did say yesterday, the elephant come and go. They're not bound to a certain territory or area. They simply go wherever the food takes them. And the beauty of the Kruger National Park, which is the park that we are adjoined to, it's a massive, massive ecosystem. 
and it allows animals to move freely huge distances which therefore means us as humans don't need to intervene in any way which is sometimes required in smaller reserves which are completely fenced in this is a female that we're looking at and you can tell that even just from seeing that small part of her body and what you're looking for here is on the forehead the female's head will be will come to kind of a 90 degree point at the tip of the forehead whereas males there you can see it nicely now whereas the males will have a far more rounded skull or forehead there we go that's the angle we're looking for You can also notice there's a small gland behind her eye where you can see some liquid has trickled down. Not very fresh, but that's a, known as a temporal gland. and They exude liquid when the elephants become excited. It could be emotions of happiness or sadness, distress. So, something that's useful to keep an eye on because if it is leaking heavily you could be therefore forewarned of any potential excitement from the elephants It's unbelievable how silently such large animals can move through thick vegetation. The rest of the herd is now out of sight to the right of us. And they've slunk off with very little noise. Well, the good news is it's not just one that needs to still cross the road. I've just heard and seen another one who will also be crossing. Look at that tail of hers. And they do hold them up like that. It can sometimes mean that they're getting agitated, but I'm not sure why she did it there. I think it's possibly because she was negotiating herself over some tricky terrain as she climbed over a fallen down knobthorn tree which in all likelihood another elephant pushed over a while back you can see how she used her foot there to help her break off a clump of grass Beautiful. I'm just going to creep forward ever so slightly.
did see tracks of a large bull nearby. And I wonder if he's not trailing this herd, and if this might be the last member to cross the road in front of us. At the moment, all I can see is a very large gray mass. In the vegetation to our left, and hard to tell exactly what it is at the moment. Not a large bull, it's a young bull. And he might give us a little bit of attitude as he crosses the road, but we'll see. Hello, boy. You'll notice a fork tail dronga in the foreground on a little branch, and they'll follow the elephant as it moves through this vegetation. And what this forktail drongo will do, and I'm sure it'll fly off any moment to stay close to the elephant, because they will hawk insects that the elephant flushes up as it moves through the vegetation. And in just a few seconds, I'm certain we'll see it fly off in the same direction that the elephant headed in. Come on, don't let me down, Drongo. It appears like it may just be enjoying the sunshine for now. But at some point, I'm almost certain it will follow that elephant. Well, like I said, it's a very thick area, so we're going to leave these elephants to their own devices and cut back to Brent with the, the herd of buffalo. So good to hear that there is a herd of buffalo. Moving on to our property, we haven't seen them for a long time, and quite often lie and follow large herds of buffalo, so good potential prospects for the future. So, back to Brent, and we'll catch up with you a little bit later. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're still with the buffalo. It looks like they're waking up a little bit. Oh, Andrew, in front of me, there's a nice big bull. Ones we're talking about. You can see how he's not nearly as gnarled as those old bulls we found around the water holes. So he's sort of in his prime uh, breeding bull. Sorry, I'm just gonna have a quick look. But you can see his, his boss is fully formed. It's not, there's no hair on it. There's actually a perfect example. There, to the left is the big bull and to the right is the younger bull. And you can actually, oh, he's gonna turn around now. But on the younger bulls, you can actually still see the hair growing. So it's not that hard matted boss yet. So. Like the term generally referred to those younger bulls is a soft boss, whereas that boy has definitely got a hard boss, and he'll be one of the breeding males in the herd. I can see, I've seen about four or five, but there's probably in a herd this size, maybe 15 or 20. Oh, there's another nice breeding bull over there. Towards the left. Uh, to the left, just as you go past that round leaf teak, there he is. Um, so there's another, another bull there. And he looks a bit older than the other one, but still in, definitely in his prime. So it looks like they're waking up. They might start moving, heading towards water. Good morning, Karen. I'm from Chicago. Karen would like to know whether these buffalo would ram a car. 
It is very unlikely. Um, with buff buffalo and herds, they act very differently to sort of the, the old boys by themselves. They will generally try to run away. Um, I've never heard of a, a buffalo herd ever ramming a car um, on purpose. Oh, lots of oxpeckers flying in. They've obviously woken up, they've been flying around, and they've spotted the buffalo, and they're like, yay, breakfast! <laughs> no, so, Karen, to answer your question, uh, no, I, I don't think they would ram the car. When you get some very big herds, you can actually find them by the dust they make in the dry season. You see this wall of dust. Good morning, Mary from Tennessee. Welcome on Drive with us this morning. Mary would like to know if the buffalo have a matriarch or patriarch when they start moving who, who leads. Um, in my experience, it's a bit of both. There will be some of the dominant bulls and the dominant cows that will sort of start the herd moving. Um, and generally, they will lead them to and from water and grazing, uh, and the rest follow. Very much a, a herd animal, so herd mentality. <coughs> Even though if one buffalo doesn't have to be one of the, the, the dominants in, in the herd, gets a fright and runs, they all run. It's, a, um, it's a, a defense mechanism in case one buffalo saw something the others didn't. So quite often it can be quite funny. One buffalo can stare intently at a stump, decide it's a lion, and just run, and then the whole herd ends up running as well. And it's quite a sight to see a big herd of buffalo stampeding through the bush. Some of the guys are lying down again. So just move around a bit forward, see if we can see that there's a couple of big bulls right at the, the edge there. And that's quite often what happens is one of their defense mechanisms. Around the edges of the herd, um, and uh, especially when they get pressured by lions, the, the big bulls sort of form a, a wall of big sharp horns. Um, that sort of are meant to keep the lions at bay. So yeah, I think my original estimate's about right. There's probably around 100 animals in this herd. And there's one, I'm going to try to get Andrew into the side, standing on top of a termite mound. And sorry, what was the name again? Alright, sorry. Um, there's a question with no name. Why do us guides always look for tracks on the right side of the road? Wouldn't we miss tracks on the left side of the road? Um, we do look on both sides, but because we are sitting on the right side of the car, we will um, generally drive around even to the left track to look at tracks um, from the right side just because we're sitting on the right side of the vehicle. Uh, good morning, Chris. Welcome on Drive this morning. 
Chris would like to know sort of the buffalo herd structure. Um, so Chris, in a breeding herd of buffalo, you will have, uh, depending on the size, a, a group of dominant males who are mostly there for breeding and defense. And then you will have um, various ages of females. Um, basically, it works very similar to a, a, a cow herd structure. Um, so basically, the, the males the, the males here would be sort of in their prime, and as soon as a female would come into estrus, they would compete for breeding. Um, but the majority of the animals in the group would either be sub-adults or, or, or adult females, um, all of breeding age. Um, even buffalo, when they get past breeding age, um, the females will stay with the, the herd um, until they are too old or get caught by lions. Um, but as you've seen, we see a lot of the old boys who sort of can't compete with the, with the, the, the bulls in their prime, uh, and they will move off to those, to the dams and drainage lines and water holes and sort of just spend their last years being grumpy. Um, because if they came into contact with a herd like this, the younger males would attack them almost immediately to try to keep the competition. So you'll find, even though there is a, a hierarchy amongst the males, um, they'll all be in very good condition and at the sort of top of their game, so to speak. Um, otherwise, they would be pushed out of the herd by younger males coming in. I see the one has decided to get a good vantage on top of the termite mound. Have a look at this one directly opposite me now. Um, oh, and he's just getting a horn in the bum from a slightly older male. But if we can zoom in on his boss, see there you can see what I was talking about the soft boss. You can actually still see the hair growing in sort of the middle parting. There's a young, a young boy. There's a slightly older boy pushing him because he can, because he's bigger. See, he's just almost, almost fully mature. He'll be of breeding age, even though he does still have a little bit of hair between his horns. He is, he is, he would be considered an adult. Amazing the amount of flies associated with a herd of buffalo. Looks like some of them are starting to move sort of south, but the others are still very much, it's quite a big section in the center of the herd that are still lying down. Lots of oxpeckers. Remember, we should be looking carefully, I have, to make sure there's no yellow bulb oxpeckers in the herd. So far, all I've seen is red. As we said, the yellow bulls, as I said a few days ago, the yellow bulls are quite rare in this area. <clears throat> Their technique is slightly different, the red bull and the yellow bull. Same, same. Pretty much the same now. Um, as I said, pesticides and things like that on domestic animals were the biggest sort of killers of oxpeckers. Um, and they have been reintroduced to a lot of areas in South Africa where they were locally extinct, but mostly, mostly red bulls. Um, yellow bulls, it's quite strange. They seem, maybe it's just a, if you head north, 
the red ball becomes the, the, the more rare one and the yellow ball becomes the more common one. I mean, in little towns in Botswana, you can find yellow billed oxpeckers on the backs of donkeys and goats. big fight going on at the back there. I don't know if you heard that. Doof. That was a bull. Just go wide. So that big bull marching through there chasing some, some of the younger bulls there. You can always see the dust there from that little bit of action. What I was talking about earlier, you can find buffalo herds from the dust that they make, especially as it gets drier. There's one of the dominant bulls with an oxpecker in his nose, looking for ectoparasites. Did you copy that? Um Good morning, Holly. Welcome on Drive. Um, Holly would like to know how long does it take for a buffalo's boss to harden? So it probably becomes, or adults, not completely hard, but enough to sort of start competing for breeding and stuff like that, um, at around four or five years old and then probably completely hard by six. And those old boys we see at the, at the, uh, at the water holes and that are probably between 12 and 15 and right at the end of their lives. Here's a little one. You can see he's got a sort of tan coat, not as dark as the, the adults yet. Oh, that's not your mom. And he got confused, thought that one was his mom, but it wasn't. Good morning, Gator Bait from Florida. That's an interesting name. Um, Gator Bait would like to know how we age buffaloes um, from sort of yearlings two years three years four years and up um, once a buffalo sort of has hit maturity um, it becomes a bit harder to uh, to age them so like with the dominant bulls here you would guess they were between five and ten um, to say exactly who's what age would be difficult and and the same with the cows you can tell the very old ones and the very young ones um, the in-between is a bit difficult, but uh, that little orange, let me just move the vehicle so we can have a look at some of the, the younger animals. There you go, like that one looking at us now, he's probably uh, close on, oh, going on 18 months, maybe a little bit younger. The one slightly down to the right, probably yeah, two, two to three years, um, and then if we go to the left, just to continue, there we go, oh, he's disappearing, no, that's a big ball, uh, the other one's disappearing. Let me just move the vehicle so we can get a better spectrum of ages to look at. Andrew in the tree. Oh, 
it looks like half of them decided to get going and the other half were like, no, it's still nap time. Let's have a look. Okay, so we see there's, um, if you go in on the calf, you can see his, his horns are starting to show, and he's starting to get a bit of darkness on the top of his coat. And so he's closing in on about a year, maybe a little bit younger. And if we go off to the right, you see there's two calves there. They're probably at about six months. Oh, there's a big boy. I had a trucker I worked with for a long time. He said, Buffalo, always look at you like you owe them money. Mm. Sort of down their nose. Um, Gatorbait, what I'll do is I'll keep looking so we can see a, a, younger, a younger animal um, to give you a, a, a better idea. But obviously we don't want to drive right into them, make them all stand up just so we can see all of them. You can see they're quite happy where we are and I'm quite happy where they are. And we don't want to disturb them. Andrew, are you keeping a lookout for that yellow bull dog specker? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they only get they don't get seen that often in the in the Sabi Sands. What I'll do is I'll show you guys the difference quickly. So in case you spot one while Andrew's pounding over the buffalo herd, you can let us know in case we miss it. Yeah, right down at the bottom here. So there's oh, the red bull, which we see quite a lot of here on buffalo, on zebra, on parda, giraffe, and that's the yellow bull. So even though it's got red on the bull, it's got a yellow, a yellow start to the bull. And another important fact is if you look at the eyes. So the yeah, uh, the red bull's got a yellow ring around the eye and the yellow bull doesn't. Other than that, they are very, very similar. Um, apart when they're flying, um, the, the red bull's got a dark rump and the yellow bull's got a very distinctive paler rump that's when they're flying away from you. So you can see all those, oh, we'll have a look now. And keep watching as they fly in, you can see the, the, the dark rump on, on a lot of them as they fly in. And while we've been sitting here, I think probably 50 or 60 ox peckers have landed in. So what they've done is they've woken up from wherever they've been sleeping, roosting last night. And as they fly in, they're like, oh, buffalo, and then just descend. It's a literal smorgasbord for an ox pecker. Oh, that little one slip. Okay, which buffalo are you on at the moment? Okay, coming up on her right. Come up to the right. See that one there? Okay, just hold there for a second. There's a young one who's got a wound on his eye. He should come forward a little bit, just now. He's between those two buffalo you're on at the moment. Let me try and get a photo, see what it looks like that wound from. Oh, he's actually lost his whole eye. So, um, if he comes forward, I'm not sure what's happened there. But he's lost his whole eye. Oh, wow. Um, can you get a, have you got a shot of him yet there? Just doesn't come into frame. Just doesn't come into frame. Um, maybe if his mom moves forward, he'll come forward. Yeah. There we go. Still suckling. But look, it's, he's completely lost his eye. Very difficult to say what's happened there, whether it's from a, a horn or a stick. But he's completely lost his left hand eye. I can't see actually if it's a he or a she. Just yet. Wow, that must be incredibly painful. A little ox pecker in his ear. There we go. 
เป็นสี่แล้ว even though the ox packers do do buffalo a favor by taking ticks off them they can also get a little bit they can cause a problem for a, a buffalo like that that's got a, an open wound especially around the eye area because um, they will sometimes actually eat the flesh out of uh, out of a, a wound on a buffalo as well and even though that buffalo has lost his eye doesn't mean he or she might not survive It just means it's uh, it's going to be a little bit more difficult, especially if you you've only got one eye to look for predators. Well, they're not looking very energetic this morning. It's possible that they drank quite late last night. Sometimes they do drink during the night. Um, And what's happening here is, and they could have fed with full moon last night. They could have fed quite late as well, or well, not a full moon, but a relatively not full moon itself, but a relatively full moon. So they might rest up for quite a while this morning and just ruminate. Here we go. There's the guy with one eye again. It's a little, a little, a little female. I get another photograph of them. Almost looks like he might have caught a horn. Um, because you can actually see the the iris sort of dripping out. So that must be very sore. Um, are you able to look at uh, screens from there? We can try. We can try. Yeah. We'll try so you guys can see. I'm not sure how well it'll come out, but there you can see how how damaged that eye is. Shame it must be very difficult for I mean, flies and all sorts of things might get into that. Good morning, Katrina. Uh, Katrina would like to know whether a lion would si single out that that uh, buffalo with a, who's lost the eye. Um, in a herd, she's offered a bit of protection by the other other animals with eyes, but um, it is possible. Say, if she was on the peripheries and her, her good eye was facing in and her bad eye was facing out, but that's one of the reasons animals are. Uh, Live in, live in these herds is more sets of eyes it's much easier to spot a predator uh, and it's not really affecting um, the mo her movement as, as yet as such so I think if there was an animal with a more uh, distinct limp um, they might focus on that rather than on a one that's lost its eye Okay, guys. I don't think these guys are going to move for a while, so it's up to you. Um, we can go look for something else, um, or we can sit with the buffalo herd for a bit longer. Um, just let us know on hashtag Safari Live or by email at questions at wildearth.tv. I definitely seem to have settled in again.
some interesting patterns about all the horns in the grass. Oh, we've got some more coming in. Just go wide for a second. This is a young bull coming in. You might get pushed off by one of the older bulls. Just came in from behind us showing uh, Fleming reflex. And she stopped a little bit further away. There's that, you owe me money look from that big bull, bull there. Just come back to the right quickly, Andrew. And so almost a little bit of a Mexican standoff. There's a, a big bull lying down there and this younger bull is walking in. He decided discretion is the better part of valor and decided to avoid where the big bull was lying down. Well, wow. um, just go all the way to the right. There's that young buffalo standing up at the back and there's a huge amount of oxpeckers on him. They all seem to think he's the one. He must have lots of ticks. But it looks like they're more just greeting um, and having a conversation. They're not actually feeding. Only the one in his ear was feeding. I mean, how many? Oh, more on that side. So let's see if we can count how many. One, two. Oh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12, I don't know, I lost count there, but at least 15 ox pickers on that single buffalo. Yeah, some of them are leaving. Alex, come in. Have we got anything on? Should we stay or should we go? Um, where are you at the moment? Uh, he's turned around, don't worry. It was that buff threat. Okay, so general consensus is we're going to leave the buffalo to themselves and um, we'll go look and see if we can find anything else.
Good vibe off Rose. What's your position? Okay, right, copy. Okay, guys, well, we're gonna hand you over to Scott, see what he's got, and we're gonna continue to try find something else um, hopefully we have some more luck this morning uh, enjoy it welcome back no major updates from myself and Brian Brian was just actually saying, when are we going to find something? And I'm not too sure when that will be. But it's a beautiful morning to be out exploring here. And for those of the viewers that are more accustomed to the drives, you'll know that things can change drastically out here in just a short matter of time. And that is most, one of the most wonderful things about this job is that there is just so much unknown and therefore huge levels of excitement when you do come across something. But there can be a few quiet spells in between. Really happy that there is a large herd of buffalo on the property though. They do. They are an animal that we don't really get to see that often here when they are in their large herds. It's mainly only the old bulls that we get to see. So good prospects and as I did mention earlier, lion like to trail large herds of buffalo. So with a little bit of luck there will be some lion hot on their heels. some elephant that have moved through this area which is a good sign and after only getting really a brief glimpse at the herd we saw a little bit earlier it'll be great to be able to find a herd that we can spend some time with there's a lot of fresh sign and they do appear to be heading in the same direction as us now isn't this interesting wasn't far from this branch in the road where I got out yesterday to explain how elephants will start to feed on these plants over the coming months and here they have just started to feed on them you can see they've taken broken one branch off And the main parts of the branch that they're actually trying to feed on is just the bark. So you can see how it hasn't fed on any of the leaves. And all it's done is chewed on this piece of bark, removed the cambium layer, and then dropped it down. So typical behavior for elephants, and they will continue to do that more and more with the round leaf teak over the coming weeks. So that'll be interesting to see. They often also strip all the leaves off and take the bark off the whole stem, if you could call it that. So, and it was just around one of these corners that I 
showed you yesterday how these round leaf teak can be deceiving in that because the elephants snap off a lot of the branches every year they don't grow very tall but often leave sh quite solid well it's a very strong wood little stumps at the base of these growths and those can be problematic if you drive over them they can either stop you in your tracks or puncture your tire Also buffalo moving through this area. A considerable amount. There's lots of buffalo dung. So buffalo and elephants are two animals we could bump into at any stage. And the elephant's tracks are heading in the same direction as us. Hopefully we can intercept them at Twin Dams, which is a waterhole not far from here. It would be wonderful to see them drinking. The buffalo I've established now are, or were heading in the opposite direction to where we're going, so not likely that we'll bump into the, these specific individuals. Come on elephants. something Brian and I were also chatting about was that we haven't seen enough snakes and we really would love to be able to show you some some more snakes sadly though I think they're just very secretive animals they are plentiful here and we often see their tracks crossing the road but I think they often sense us coming, feel the vibrations from the vehicle and slither off before we get to see them. These elephant tracks are back on the road here and there looks to be a small baby in amongst them. Which way did they head from here? We'll do is we'll go down and check the water hole. If that doesn't provide us with anything, then we'll loop back in the general direction that the elephants have been moving in. Kingfisher calling that you would have heard as we drove past. Chick -burr! is my impersonation, just to give you an idea because there often are several birds calling at the same time when we do point out any call, so it's nice to try and give you an idea of which bird it exactly you are wanting or describing just so that we don't confuse you. No further sign of the elephants coming down here, so they could have well have continued in a easterly direction, which was their general direction of movements. So we'll loop around in that direction. And in order to do that, we're going to drop down into the riverbed. So the signal may get a bit shaky here. 
but it, it varies from day to day. Christina in Texas, good morning, welcome on board. Now, Christina was obviously watching a drive probably in December last year. And on one of these drives, myself and Jason, one of the cameramen at the time, managed to see a black mamba. It was a brief glimpse of a black mamba slithering into a cavity of a marula tree. But people did get a glimpse of it and a black mamba is a notorious snake in Africa, it's highly venomous and in this day and age with great uh, medical response teams available and just really good medical services, there's a good chance that you would survive a bite provided you are kept ventilated so somebody can breathe artificially for you because it does attack your nervous system, black mamba venom, neurotoxic venom, and your whole body shuts down. But if somebody breathes for you, you can still survive a bite, but they are a deadly snake, one of the, the most deadly that we get here. And we had a brief glimpse of it going into a cavity of a marula tree, but, uh, and we did go back and check this. So Christina was asking whether we ever went back to check if it was poking its head out of its hole, and it's not necessarily its nest, Christina, it's possibly just a place where it decided to hide out. But we never saw it again there, but not far from where we did see it there, we saw another black mamba, potentially the same one. They do have small territories. So there is still a black mamba lurking around the quarantine clearings. But I've only seen it once more. And the second time we saw it, it was actually crossing a road and didn't manage to get the camera onto it in time. One of the ultimates, I guess, to, if we could choose to see a snake, would be a large African rock python. Um, they're not as fast moving. Typically wouldn't slither off as quickly and it would be easier to film than most of the other snakes. And they're really beautiful, the African rock python. We've seen a tiny baby, a newly, bo newly born hatchling on one of the drives, had a great sighting of it slowly slithering across the road. Probably one of the best snake sightings I've managed to share with, with you so far. But that was a long time ago and we need another one. Interesting, the elephants that we were tracking were right in front of us. Yay! And I was just, I saw their tracks in the sand before I saw them. And what they'll do is they'll come down into these riverbeds to dig into the water table and be able to drink fairly well filtered water running just a, a meter or so below where we're driving and as we continue driving and these elephants move out of shot we will show you where they've been digging in the sand in order to get to some water and that just saves them having to go to water holes I guess Can hear a 
another Woodlands Kingfisher. It's perched very close to us. Sadly, the sunlight is terrible in terms of providing you a shot, but the audio that we're getting from it is great. And Brian's going to try and work some magic here to show you it. There it is. Kind of silhouetted against the sunlight at the moment. Hopefully it'll let off another call. Interestingly enough, while we wait for the kingfisher to let off another call, these elephants were just below us in the drainage line. We were so close behind them when we did veer off two twin dams before coming back, uh, looping around to see if they were here. So just out of view, and I am going to keep up with the, the elephants rather because they are making some headway. But that's a Woodlands Kingfisher there, and you did hear it calling earlier. Now Brian, if you don't mind just trying to pan down onto the left here. The riverbed, and we might be able to see if they've had any success in getting to the water table. Try and pull. Oh, no. But you can see where they've been digging there and you have pulled a little bit more. Okay. And almost creating very small holes just big enough for their trunk to fit in. And you can actually see the, the water there. Can you Brian? Yep. Well isn't that just fantastic? So they've dug down just a meter or so, and there you can see the water that they would have been drinking. And as it seems out, it's a small hole, almost just big enough for the elephant's trunk, and there's another one just up ahead there. Elephants are in this herd. It was just a mother and one cup there. I'm guessing there'll be more than just two. There they are. Which is good news. And it's also good news because the signal's got a little better now that we've popped out of the room. And it looks like a very cute little baby. And this mother. Just gonna stop here. uncommon for little youngsters to come up to the vehicles to investigate. So we might get lucky there. And I can see now there are a few more elephants moving through this thick vegetation so it wasn't just the mother and a little calf. seems very relaxed for now. I'm just going to try and give it a bit of a wide berth. 
just to make sure. A little baby's coming back out to investigate, which is also great. Another one just popped out from our left, which gave me a bit of a fright, but it's a youngster. So we've got nothing to worry about. The bird that you can hear calling insistently now is an orange-breasted bush shrike, a very pretty bird. But I've only managed to show you once, is that Puffles up Dan. So difficult to see now, but the little calf is hiding right behind her mother. And I think as the mother continues to walk past us, the calf might pluck up a little bit of courage and decide to come up to the vehicle and investigate us. There you can see the little head of the calf between its mother's legs. Incredible to see the comparison of what this young calf may grow into when it gets older. The mother continues to feed towards us. Like I say, very relaxed. Now that audio that you just heard is one of the greatest sounds you can hear in Africa. Negative, could you go with the position and direction they're heading in please? Okay, copy, thanks. Just ask Brent where about, please. Okay, copy, thanks. So I was just getting relayed some information there from Alex that Brent was trying to relate to me. But as I did say, that audio, that low rumble is such a great noise to hear. And it's a noise of contentment I often find with elephants. Look at this little baby trying to get to grips with its trunk. Yeah. <laughs> Tail out. In a hurry. So this, this youngster wasn't very brave, but sometimes they do come up to us. Copy that, thanks Alex. Well, very good news. Brent got a report that there were some wild dog tracks on the of Cut Line, our northern boundary. So he has headed into that area and we'll be following up on them. And wouldn't it be wonderful to see wild dog again? Well, what I'm going to try and do is loop ahead of this herd of elephants so we can get them feeding past us. There look to be quite a few of them. Give me 
me a minute or two just to get into position and we can look forward to some great shots hopefully as they walk past us and in the meantime like I said we're with Brent tracking down some wild dog hopefully it's a tricky area to track because it is on our boundary and on top of that wild dog are an exceptionally difficult animal to track because they move such huge distances in such short spaces of time This is going to be good. Elephants are also approaching a clearing, which is going to make for some great viewing when they do get you. Where are the best places for us to wait now? I think we've got the playful youngster we were hoping to find. This individual saw the vehicle and started heading straight towards it, the one in front. So watch closely because it could continue to come steaming up to us. In the mean... Okay, oh, let's stay on it. Here we go. There's just so much action going on with this herd at the moment. And while Brian's focused on the task at hand, keeping an eye on this youngster. There's two of a fairly similar age playing about. little baby is in and amongst the elephant that you're looking at there, the smallest one that we saw running off a little bit earlier. And I'm guessing it will come back into shot as it follows its mother out into the little gap which she's heading towards. close past us here, yeah, isn't this great? And now that the mother's closer, the baby may feel a bit more bold. Oh, no. <laughs> Look at how cute this is. These animals are relaxed, they are just so wonderful to view. So, we can be fortunate that this mother is allowed so close to her youngster. again they are heading into an even bigger or a better clearing where we should get some more great shots of them I 
gonna, rather than repositioning many times, try and get into a spot where it is gonna be really open and clear. And just wait for them to come through to us. It shouldn't take them long if they continue at the rate that they've been moving. However, after a close analysis of their options, I think they are going to continue on this side of the vegetation, so this is where we'll position ourselves. The two youngsters at the back still playing with one another, the same two that we saw playing with one another earlier. <whistles> A spaghetti junction on twin dams. Brian's doing a great job, it's not easy, <laughs> the current thick vegetation these elephants have decided to feed in. Copy that, thanks, Alex. Just gonna have one last look. 
excuse me, at these elephants. I copied everything there. Thank you, Alex. Let them know. Copy, thank you, sir. Spend a bit more time with these elephants and then head there. Copied everything, thank you very much. I'm just going to spend a few more minutes with these Ellies and then head over there and give them a hand. Well, this is the clearing I was hoping they're going to pop into. Negative, Alex. I haven't checked today. And now oh, the sunlight is perfectly situated behind us, so Brian's going to have some fun now. beautiful sight this is with the big matriarch leading with a tiny baby following closely in tow You can really tell that this whole herd is just in such a good mood this morning. They're all playing around with one another and providing us with some incredible views. Baby sizing up an, a slightly smaller one, as you can see, or a slightly bigger one than it, but a, another small individual. But they're not taking the bait. This youngster right here, though, has taken our bait, that's for certain. And it came up to shake its head and say hello. Hello, boy. What a magical sighting this has been and I'm glad that they are heading into a thick area because it's going to be, it would have been difficult to leave them had they not been because there's a report of Kunuma, a young male leopard who we would all love to see again I have no doubt. He's just been seen heading into the Juma property, there's no visual of him now but we're going to head into that area and give the guys a hand trying to relocate. <coughs> There's two vehicles having a look around there now, and we'll be the third to help out, and that's the maximum of vehicles allowed to, to work a certain area, because if that animal is found, then at least all three of you can join the sighting.
And interestingly enough, I just heard other elephants trumpeting in the direction where we're going. So, it seems like the elephants are back in town, which is great. And also good to hear that Kanyuma's back in town. According to the update, where can you... Welcome back guys. We are... Uh, I'm trying to have a double check there. It's, it looks like a Jacobin cuckoo. Not the, he's a little bit far off the road. Oh, and he's off. I'm almost definitely going to have to enjoy the, the cuckoos and whatnot while we can. We're not going to be around for too much longer. So, what we're going to do now is um, we're going to head down towards the hyena den and see if there, there's any activity in that area at the moment. Um, hopefully, after Scott's incredible sighting last night, um, we can have some luck here this morning. <laughs> I think that the key got stuck. <laughs> Push to start landing. Exactly. So, I hope you guys enjoyed those ellies with, with Scott. Um, we followed up on some wild dog tracks, but unfortunately they crossed our boundary. Um, but hopefully they'll come back this afternoon. You never know where the dogs are going to appear while they're not denning. Oh, there's... Oh, can't see it. We've just got a long distance visual of den. I can't see if it's active at the moment. Can you see? You're a bit higher than me there, Andrew. I can't see anything. And lots of tracks up and down the road. Hopefully, one of the moms is home. It's not looking very hopeful. There's a mom right here, lying on the ground. I don't see any youngsters. Miss that. Oh, right next to her. There isn't. I can see two. One adult, one sub adult. Um, so the one lying right next to us scratching the ear. And then there's a sub adult. Um, if you go to the mouth of the den, just to the left, lying up in the grass. Oh, it's very difficult to sell. This is so difficult to sex them, but this could even be a, just a, a male, just judging from body size. But I mean, even hyena researchers get the sex wrong on adults.
and there's a, a sub-adult. Flop. <laughs> it's a long night. I'm just going to have a quick look at the back side of the den, see if there's possibly um, any others that side and, the, and if the youngsters are out, otherwise we'll come back to these two. Often multiple holes in the dens always helps to check the others, although just judging from the usage that the side has not been used in a while. So no, I don't think I think that the main hole where we normally see them is the one that's being used at the moment. If we sit patiently, patiently um, the little ones might come out. Even with the mothers not here, just the fact that there are there's another adult and a sub-adult here um, could cause them to to come out. Rebecca, Zoe, and Nisikai is active. Remember guys, if you have any questions, send them in on Twitter to hashtag Safari Live or email questions at wildearth.tv. Having a good bath.
Would the less dominant individuals be left to guard the cups and then the more dominant go out? Not necessarily. It can it can work both ways. Okay. Uh, with hyenas, mostly they'll uh, not spend that much time in the den unless they have, unless they have cubs. So they'll actually sleep out where they stop foraging in the bush. But every now and then they'll come by just to have a look at the den, mm. check on the new additions to the clan. Lots of scratching and grooming going on. I wonder if the, the fleas are starting to get bad around the den. Coming to say hello, good morning. You can definitely see all the fly bites on the ears. Let's see where it's off to. Oh, decided um, time to leave. I'm just going to reverse just so you can see where that individual is going. No, it's gone. He's off. It might, it might be fleas, it might be something else. Decided he's gonna go probably find another place to lie up for the morning. Let me just go forward a bit for you there, Andrew. You can just catch him disappearing into the bush. doesn't look like heard anything to cause any excitement. Maybe just got tired of fleas or whatever. It was irritating him there. And um, I think it's like it disappeared. So we'll go back to the sub-adults. Maybe get one last glimpse. Maybe he just decided, no, nah, he is. Or she is on her, his, her or his way. Bless you. So we've got one very sleepy sub adult. Oh, this got a bit of a head rise. Don't think it's going to last too long. He's lying on his left side. And he's lying on a sort of a slope, so. He's just where the shade from the termite mound is. 
you might get up and move shortly as the sun creeps around and, and move further into the shade or even at that age you might possibly go back into the den Good morning, D from Minnesota. Welcome on Game Drive with us. This morning, um, Dee's asking where they're sitting so close to Hyena and can we smell them? Oh, fortunately, the wind is in our favor this morning, but uh, from time to time you can, um, especially if they've just defecated. Um, was it. Andrew, were you with me when that hyena vomited close I think to us? It was Brian. Oh, it was Brian. Well, Brian and I were sitting at a hyena den and a, and a hyena vomited up very close to us and the smell was absolutely terrible. But so, um, I spotted hyena dens, they can smell but they're not too bad. Aubrey, Aubrey coming. Aubrey or Andrew, do you copy? Aubrey, Aubrey, do you copy? Uh, Aubrey, Scott's found in Konzo, heading north on Weaver's Nest towards Tree House of that my daughter. Okay, copy that. Yeah, also we book a Konzo here where we were stopping when you drive past us. Yeah, try to follow them. We're still having some coffee. We're coming up here again. Copy. Thanks very much, Aubrey. Uh, Brent, come back to yours. Go ahead. Uh, did you pick up the Macondo for my dash this morning and get close to go again? Uh, Mike Grover uh, picked them up and I went there, but by the time I got there, there's a lot of vehicles driven across and I could only find one decent track. And I don't think they came onto Vuyatela. I think they did go... Um, for the for the north, I checked uh, Sandy Patch and uh, we had tele access and we had nothing on there, so I'm only guessing they must have gone for the north. But there was a very it was very busy there this morning. Okay, I'm at Sydney Dam. A couple of parlors around, but they're very relaxed. So I'm scratching off things, really. Copy, no problem. Not much happening here. Yeah, Well guys, I don't think much else is going to happen at the den site this morning, apart from what we've seen already. Oh, he's lifted his head off. Do these hyenas allow suckle? No. No. no only suckle from their, their, their mother. Okay. Not like lions that will share suckling amongst the females. 
So um, I think we're gonna head on and see what else we can find. Don't think we're gonna get too much more action in this area. Bye bye little limnies. It's quite interesting if you look at um, animal names in, in, in the different uh, languages, local languages in Africa. So, uh, a hyena in Zulu is an Mpisi, and in Shangan it's an Mnisi. Uh, in Tswana, and um, Lozi and Bemba from Botswana, Zambia, um, it's a Fisi, and even in Swahili, in East Africa, it's also a Fisi. So even though the languages are completely different, the animal name, or the, the core of the animal name, has sort of continued through. Um, another, there's a few animals like that in certain areas. Um, Buffalo is another one that has a very similar name throughout quite a few um, languages. It's Inyati, Nyari. Uh, so it, it's quite interesting. Another, another few words that are almost always very, very similar. And I even found this when traveling in Central Africa, which is a completely different set of lang languages, is, is the word for meat as in sort of food, to eat meat is, is nyama and it's exactly the same in Zulu, Swahili, um, Indabele, Tswana, Sutu, Venda, Tosa, Shangan, um, Bemba, Nyanja, Lozi um, and even Miene and Teke and Fang um, in Central and West Africa. So it's amazing that some of those very important words um, are the same throughout and that, that does show that most of the Nguni or Bantu languages do come from a, a originally from a, a very single source so guys if you have any questions please oh let's see if Andrew can grab is it oh he's gonna fly over us too quickly there's a battalier uh, he's moving uh, way too quickly for us, I'm afraid. Uh, is he going to turn around? Nope. What we could do now, since we are in the area, is we can pop down to the Philemon's Dip uh, Hyena Den as well because it is possible to have more than one den site active within a clan's territory especially if there are multiple females with cubs at the same time Was it a stand one, one o'clock. One o'clock. Oh, well spotted. There we go. Let me just see if we can get a better view. I think this poor little stand book, judging from the area we're in, is possibly the one that lost its mate. Oh, there he goes. Um, to Karula a few evenings ago.
guys if you have any questions uh, on Twitter please send them through with the hashtag Safari Live um, and or via email at questions at wildearth.tv yeah, Did you? Ah, then it wasn't the one who lost its um, mate to Karula. But those Tienbach have very small territories of around two hectares, so around just over three acres that they live in. Interesting little fact about a Tienbach is they are one of the few species in in the area we operate in here that are completely. Um, non-water dependent so they get enough water from dew and, and what they eat and so they don't actually have to drink I mean they will drink if they have the choice but they don't have to drink Uh, just in front of that Madoda Ingwe on Weaver's Nest heading towards Treehouse or heading north towards Treehouse. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, I must be on the dog, so what I did because. One and refer across to the map. This one coming from Garamay. Okay, copy. I'll relay that message to Scott. Alex, do you hear me? Um, Alex, could you relay a message to Scott for me? Um, the, that uh, the tracks he's got are a separate set of male leopard tracks, um, and Aubrey has got the other set of male leopard tracks. So it could possibly be the two. Um, Aubrey thinks it could possibly be the two the brothers, quarantine and and Kunyama, coming in from different areas. Copy that. There we go. Hello, old boy. Got a few old boys here. I think, um, we've had enough buffalo for today. So we just would like you to let us pass. Thank you very much, old man. Or walk in the road. Up to you. Now you got some shade. So Scott is following up on some leopard tracks and we're just going to check very carefully down here to help them out to make sure that the, that animal hasn't crossed this road. And I don't know if you heard me there passing the message on uh, through final control to Scott. 
possibly could be two male leopards that walked onto Jumo this morning, which is quite exciting. Negative, Alex. But no tracks coming out yet. This uh, area seems to be a bit of a hot spot for leopards and leopard tracks since I've been here. This is where we found um, uh, no, Aina. This is where we found uh, Karula well, uh, for the first time for me. Um, and then we have been following tracks up and down and in around this area a couple of times. And also Mvula from yesterday actually walked through this area to where he was seen um, in the north. Good morning, Rick and Susie from Hawaii. They're asking about the feather in my hat. Uh, there it is. Um, I think it's a Woodlands Kingfish. I picked it up on the road, but it's, it's very difficult to tell. It could be also from, as you said, a lilac breasted roller. It could be also from a starling. But uh, I think it's a, a Woodlands. But I just picked it up while I was tracking yesterday and I thought it would make a nice addition to the hat. <laughs> Well, now I can't get it back in. There we go. So this is a, one of the points we need to check quite carefully. Where these roads come in. Right, we'll go check that hyena then quickly. And then we will check the next road around to give Scott a hand. find out now. Aubrey coming. Right. Aubrey, that second set of tracks, the not the ones that Scott's following, uh, where exactly were they? Okay, copy. Thanks, Aubrey. Uh, you can just let Scott know that Aubrey's changed his mind. It's the same set of tracks. In a den now. Oh, I like that you can smell yeah, look, uh, elephants. And there's tracks here, and there's some fresh dung in the road. Okay, 
might actually go back uh, to places where I last saw him going in there. Fucking out. Oh, okay. Copy that. Doesn't look like there's been many tracks on the ground here. There's buffalo dung and elephant dung. I'm not seeing any fresh hyena dung or hyena tracks. And if um, you can zoom up on the entrance hole there, Andrew, please. You can see we had a little bit of rain a few days ago, and you can actually still see the ripple marks from the rain and there's no fresh tracks going in and out. So uh, this den site is definitely not active at the moment. But it's always worth checking because they do, the den sites ch and the activity change very regularly. my interview here, yeah? this den site was active and the one we were at earlier was not. Strong smell of elephant in the area. Go have a look if we can find some general game up on the quarantine clearings um, and towards Gary Dam. 
Uh, it's getting a bit warm and there's been quite a lot of elephant tracks, so they might have headed down towards the dam to drink. And uh, there's a nice youngster there. All very fluffy, they're very pretty antelope. I almost think they, and especially when they're young with all that, very, very fluffy. But so we're gonna go across to, to Scott now um, to see what he's got on that side. Um, and again, thank you very much for joining us this morning. It's been a, a bit of a slow morning, but there's still really nice stuff to see. Great to actually see a nice breeding. Welcome back, and our quest to find Kunuma has proved to be very exciting because we did find some extremely fresh tracks of his um, on one of the roads heading towards Treehouse Dam. But then we've lost the tracks, he veered off the road, and we're not sure where exactly he's headed, but at least we've got a very good idea of where he could be this afternoon. So we will continue to spend some time snooping about here but don't think we're going to get lucky before this drive comes to a close the most important thing when tracking any of the elusive animals like leopard is that by keeping a, a tab on their general area of movement and direction of movements it will aid greatly in us following up later even though we've had an unsuccessful tracking situation this morning at least this afternoon we've got a good idea where he's headed and the great news is on top of everything else is that he's heading straight into Juma. He crossed over one of the boundaries when he was seen coming into the property and he went into a very thick block that Andrew couldn't, one of the other game drive vehicles, couldn't follow him in. So I think we're going to get lucky this afternoon but sadly no joy this morning. And what a morning it's been though. We've seen some great sightings of animals that we haven't been seeing too much of recently a large herd of buffalo that Brent had and the breeding herd of elephants or two actually that myself and Brian got to see which is great amongst a few other critters along the way so I hope you all enjoyed this morning's safari and I'm certainly looking forward to getting out this afternoon already because Kunyuma is a leopard that I've probably viewed more than any other leopard in the two and a half months that I spent here over November, December and January and he really is a beautiful specimen How much time the Alex are again drive channels making a racket? Now even though we haven't been lucky up till this point he could pop out anywhere now, so I'm still scanning furiously, hoping that we're going to pull it back at the last moment. But there's an eagle that Brian might be able to try. No, it's, it's going to be a tricky one, but Brian right there. Yeah, might try and saw on just to finish off this morning's drive, but it's in a tricky spot there with the sun. Yeah, let's the let's scrap it, otherwise we're going to get blinded. Oh no, well done. Well done, Brian. But a big thank you from myself, Brian, Alex and Brent and Andrew for following us this morning and look forward to this afternoon's PM drive.